we call that now the first book of Enoch. And we're going to go through that one. Uh, because each one of these we could do that with. Could do that with any of these to, to see because we have to test them. Well, just to remind us that we're not to take to add to the Bible or take from it. We've already gone over Proverbs 30, Revelation 22 uh, in the introduction. And what the consequences are doing it. So it's a serious. Now, why do people get interested in this? If we take a look at, at Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Now, I've been really curious. You've heard about uh, the, uh, curiosity killed the cat, right? When the cats are really curious, they put themselves at risk. Well, I, I've been really curious, and curiosity is not a bad thing. We just must be careful about that. Uh, and itching ears, meaning wanting to hear more. You go to where somebody tells you uh, what you want to hear. Uh, and First John uh, 4, verse uh, 1, again in the ESV, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we set reminder, there are many false prophets. Well, before we can examine what we call the first book of Enoch, we probably should know... Who's Enoch? Fair enough. Sounds like a biblical character. And indeed, we look in Genesis 5 and we read the genealogy of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah. So you've got 10 patriarchs from Adam to Noah. Enoch was uh, the seventh one. And if you date from the year of creation, Enoch was born at 622 years after the creation of Adam. So, and they lived longer lives then, but you had, he had six ancestors meaning immediate ancestors, and uh, his life overlapped Adam's life by 308 years. So let's see now, if you're alive and your six ancestors uh, were alive, let's see how many years, you know, that's uh, nearly a thousand years back uh, is all of those ancestors. So, I mean, it's one thing to see your grandchildren and some are great-grandparents, very few people nowadays get to be great great grandparents, much less go back five or six uh, uh, grandparents level. But Enoch uh, did, and <clears throat> he was the father of Methuselah and the great grandfather of Noah. So let's take a little bit more uh, look at the life uh, of Enoch, and it's interesting in, in Genesis five and verses twenty one through twenty four we read that he was removed by God at the age of three sixty five. And that was a youngster compared to the other, uh, his ancestors. Five of his six ancestors remained alive at the time uh, Enoch was taken away. And we'll read that in Genesis 5, verses 21 through 24. Uh, Enoch lived 65 years, begot Methuselah. And after he uh, begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God, which is an interesting phrase, 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So first of all, I want to take a look at this term, walked with God, because it's a pretty important character. They're attributing a, a book, actually, uh, we'll, we'll come to see three books uh, to Enoch. So take it, let's take a look at what does this mean. If we look at this term, walked, under Strong's, it's H. Uh, 1980, it can mean go, come, walk, to be conversant with. So if you walk with somebody, in fact, I believe I didn't put it on this uh, in Proverbs, can two be agreed, or walk together unless they be agreed. So walking together means they're conversant with. And we use the same word shows up in Genesis 3.8. In Genesis 3.8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this word, uh, walk, uh, walking or walking with God, can mean conversant with, uh, could also mean literally walking, but it can mean metaphorically walking. Uh, fundamentally, then, we look at, for God took him. And let's take a look at the word took. Well, that's uh, uh, Strong's H3947. And I put down three uh, uses of the word took which commonly mean move or remove from one place to another. 
In Genesis 5 and verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So they're using the English word took. In Genesis 2.15, same word, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So moving from one place to another, Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So Adam went into the garden and then he was removed from the garden. So you have this term that somebody was taken, meaning in this case Enoch walked with God, he was taken. And then I looked at all the usages in the Bible that Strong used for this word took. And there's a lot of them. And if you want, I'll be happy to send you the slides uh, um, electronically. I'll be happy to email it so you can see all of this. I mean, we can just go through all of these different nuances of that um, of that taken. Now, it's not, there's very little in the Bible about the patriarch Enoch. Um, <clears throat> we do have uh, a New Testament reference to Enoch in Hebrews 11 in verse 5. In Hebrews 11 verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away, remember that word took that we used in the Old Testament, so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Well, that's very interesting because it's confirming that Enoch was taken away and that Enoch himself was pleasing to God. So it wasn't like it says, and he was struck by lightning and fried to a crisp, you know, or something. It doesn't tell us that. Uh, it gives us this uh, hint there. There's, uh, uh, there's also the reference in Jude uh, one. Verse 14, in Jude one fourteen, now Enoch, and by the way, there are a few other references that put Enoch in the genealogies. I'm not reading through the genealogies. In Jude one fourteen, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes when 10,000 of his saints, and if you read on through 15, to execute judgment on all, to convict those who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So you have this, this expression in Jude that references a prophecy that Enoch made. Well, that's really quite interesting. So we're going to explore that here uh, in, a, in a little bit. Now, I'd mentioned earlier, we talked about the first book of Enoch. There's actually three, and they're not really particularly related. Um, but we should point out when people talk about the book of Enoch they're really speaking about the first book of Enoch unless they specifically say otherwise the second book of Enoch is also called two Enoch Slavonic Enoch Slavonic uh, 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 Slavic Enoch or the secrets of Enoch and the third book of Enoch also called the book of palaces the book of the Rabbi Ishmael of the high priest or the revelation of Metatron now this comes interesting because each of these has apparently different original languages. So, uh, but we're only going to focus today on uh, the first book of Enoch, commonly called the book of Enoch. Well, the first book of Enoch is really a compilation. It's composed of 90 documents. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had 90 documents in my house, it would be hard to put them all together in different places. But somehow, whoever did this, they had these uh, uh, <clears throat> pulled pull these uh, documents together uh, in one place into, uh, into a book or a scroll. They were written in Aramaic and Greek and finally Ethiopic. And I found, oh, that was interesting, written in Ethiopic. And if you look at the different versions of the, of the existing or the manuscripts, they're inconsistent. They have contradictions uh, within them. We'll get, to, we'll get to some of that. So basically, it's a compilation of smaller uh, messages. Now, the pieces of the uh, first book of Enoch were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those were jars that were kept scrolls in on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea in the caves by the Essenes. Now, the Essenes were a lesser sect of Jews. The major sects of the Jews were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Very little is, 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 in fact, the Bible doesn't mention the Essenes at all. 
but it was a sect of Jews, and they were preserving these kinds of writings. But they weren't accepted by the Jews, uh, 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 except for this uh, small Jewish sect. Uh, they were known around 200 BC and then thereafter, uh, what they call the intertestament, uh, intertestamentary period. So it gives rise to say, well, if Enoch wrote the book, and Enoch was around 1,000 after the birth of Christ, and now we have 3,000 years later, when, did the book of e when was the book of Enoch written? Well, that's almost 3,000 years after the life of Enoch. Uh, because the oldest parts of the book of Enoch are dated 1st and 2nd century, some will say 3rd century, before Christ. After Daniel, after the, da the prophet Daniel, and uh, uh, before the birth of Christ. So the most complete manuscripts that we have, we have bits and pieces of the writings from that uh, 100 to 200 uh, BC, uh, that were, but bits and pieces, but nothing complete. The most complete manuscripts were written in the 15th and 16th century in the Ethiopic language called Gaez. And which is why the Ethiopians have put more of this together. Um, so when we ask ourselves, say, well, if I wanted to write a book that was really popular uh, and I wanted to get instant recognition, you know, would you suppose it would help if you put a popular name on it? And that's apparently what was happening here. Uh, and as we'll see when we go, when we give it a test. Uh, a, a scriptural test because we know very little about Enoch just and I've shown you what very little other than what's in the uh, very few scriptures other than what's in the actual genealogies you might think of all of these writings as spin-offs now some of you have seen have television and you've seen situation comedies the sitcoms and if you remember uh, all in the family uh, there were spin-offs from that. I think the Jeffersons were a spin-off from that. And there are popular TV sitcoms. When you have a spin-off, they take a character and they go from that. So this appears to be a spin-off that is expanding upon this a little bit of an introduction. Now, the Ethiopians, or the Ethiopic language, they use the Book of Enoch in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church for their liturgy. Well, what's a liturgy? Well, a liturgy is a formula or pattern of statements used in a worship service. If you have a Roman Catholic or Protestant background, you'll often find that people, the cleric says something, the people respond uh, uh, uniformly back and forth. I know that was true in the Methodist church. I visited a Roman Catholic church when I was in college. It was true there, although uh, their, theirs was in, in Latin. Fortunately, I'd had Latin, so I'm probably one of the few that could actually knew what they were talking about. But here, the liturgy uh, is used in the liturgy in Ethiopia. Uh, and, and so we have this, this strength of the Book of, Ethiop uh, uh, Book of Enoch in Ethiopia. Uh, and it's not just here and there uh, in the United States, because it is, this pops up in, uh, in ministerial forms from time to time uh, about this. There was a guy in Eastern Europe uh, who uh, was at uh, one of our feast sites and he said the only place in the world that he could find that was really keeping the truth was in Ethiopia. And I said, really? Well, why? And he said, well, they keep both the Sabbath and Sunday so they can't be wrong. And that was the place that he was certain it would be the right thing to do uh, to do that because that's the only place he could find that was keeping it right and of course what he didn't tell me was as I found out later is that they they uh, they they elevate the, the book of Enoch so what about this book of Enoch what does it look like well it's a compilation and it's divided into chapters you can see 108 chapters and each of these are little scrolls or books in themselves book of watchers book of parables book of the luminaries the dream visions epistle of Enoch the birth of Noah, and the final book of Enoch. So, well, that's fine. You say, I'm not going to sit down and read 108 chapters. I have a hard time getting through the Bible. Folks, that's why you hired me, okay, <laughs> uh, to go through this. Now, uh, I uh, I like science fiction. I've, I'm, I really enjoy Robert Heinlein. 
on some of his uh, stories. Michael Crichton, the guy that wrote Jurassic Park. He also wrote a number of other uh, uh, interesting books on sci-fi. As a kid, I just loved Edgar Rice Burroughs. He's the guy that wrote Tarzan at the Earth's core, John Carter of Mars and those whole series and the moon uh, stories and such. And, oh, it was great. It was great stuff. It was exciting. I had itching ears, and I couldn't wait to add more to that. So let me summarize this for you, if I could. First book of Enoch refers to, calls reference to the Bible of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. But then they say males and divine beings, they call them the Elohim, which is right from the Bible, came down from heaven and had sex with human women, and then the race of giants, the Nephilim, were born. Now, some of you uh, uh, may recall Mr. Sandy gave that sermon at, what, March of last year, uh, did, uh, did angels uh, reproduce with women? Uh, and so, according to the book of Enoch, these were the mighty men that were of old and warriors of renown. These were giants, uh, as it were, and they're saying that. And so now you have then this first section of the book called the Book of Watchers. And a whole society of angels, fallen angels, led by their chief, uh, Shemihaza. Uh, but this is just the first book, and you know how many there were. Uh, it's quite a few there. So if we keep looking in the Book of Watchers, this is a society of fallen angels. And then let's read right in it, uh, in Enoch 7, 3 through 5. And the giants began to kill men and devour them, and they drank their blood. So it gets pretty gruesome. Uh, it's pretty icky poo foo stuff in here. The watchers are devious angels. They're skilled in evil supernatural arts, which they taught to humanity. And then we look through it. They taught how to make weapons of war in Enoch 8 1. Asael taught men to make swords of iron. They taught sorcery. Enoch 8 3 about Shemihaza taught spells, how to put spells on people. Uh, and they were into astrology with uh, Enoch 8.3 about Cocobel taught the signs of the stars. You can read that in the newspaper today even. Been around for a while. So if we take a look then at this book of the watchers, uh, the culmination of all of this is that humanity cries to God for help. And of course, according to the book, God doesn't let him down. He sends four archangels. And the first archangel warns of Noah about the coming flood. Going to destroy the earth. Uh, second archangel imprisons Asael and casts him into darkness. The third archangel, Gabriel, uh, was sent to destroy the sons of the watchers. In fact, it uses very earthy language to do this. Go, Gabriel, to the bastards, the half-breeds, to the sons of the miscegenation, mixed uh, race, and destroy the sons of the watchers from among the sons of men, in Enoch 10.9. And fourth. Uh, uh, the fourth archangel, Michael, was sent to imprison the king of the watchers, Shemihaza. So the whole idea is that Enoch was sent to, to warn the watchers they will be destroyed. Well, that's a real eyeful. There, I've saved you from that. But it gives you an idea of what's going on there. Now, there are themes that are in this, uh, the book of Enoch. You have an expectation of a Messiah. Sounds reasonable. Final judgment, we read that in the Bible. Salvation, we read that. Resurrection, we read that. Heavenly visions, we read that. And these themes are typical then of the Jewish apocalyptic thought during this second temple period, meaning from between the time of Daniel to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And these are parallel themes we read in the book of Daniel uh, uh, that we read there. Now, the Jews were aware of the uh, book of Enoch, but the rabbinic historians, except for the Essenes, they rejected the book of Enoch. But the Essenes, they accepted that, and they described Enoch as Metatron, which was a second or lesser Yahweh. So they were saying, we have hierarchies of gods, and this, is, uh, this one, uh, 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 Enoch himself, would be a lesser god. Um, and then the Jewish uh, mystical religion, Kabbalah, embraces the portions of the book of Enoch and compares Enoch to Adam. So remember, the Essenes were the ones that preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which collected biblical and secular documents. They were kept in the Qumran Caves in the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. Now, I haven't been to the Dead Sea. I have been to, uh, I've been to the Salt Sea in, 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 uh, in Utah. Uh, quite interesting, so I can kind of imagine. But there are caves that are around the rest. Um, 
And what they did was they hid their stuff. Uh, uh, and their group goes back to, what, a couple hundred years before Christ uh, and in through the first century. So the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were mostly in Egyptian manuscripts put on leather or papyrus, uh, reed paper, and, and interesting, etchings in copper. And they were first found. Now, mind you, now, this is uh, almost 2,000 years later, found in 1947. Uh, for your entertainment purposes, so the Jewish mystical religion Kabbalah is embraced by the singer-entertainer uh, Madonna. So there, you've got the full flavor here of somebody who's uh, going with this. But it wasn't just Jewish interactions with the Book of Enoch. Islam also had an interaction with the Book of Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, you have the prophet Idris, uh, and he's mentioned twice in the Quran. And there is a written hadith or saying, after all, Muhammad was illiterate and he had people write things down for him. So Muhammad supposedly met the prophet Idris in the fourth heaven on his way to the seventh heaven. This is in the Muslim writing about the, the night journey as he ascended up to the seven heavens. And he met this prophet Idris who was uh, along, uh, uh, along the way. So there is some interaction in the Islamic tradition for the book of Enoch. And then, of course, there's the Christianity has some interaction with the book of Enoch. As I mentioned, the book, the book of uh, Revelations, uh, uh, Revelation parallels with uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, and you'll find that it's quoted by some early Christian leaders. Uh, and, but uh, by the year eight, uh, eight, uh, 300 AD, it was almost universally cast aside, except for the Ethiopians, as not being revealed scripture. Now, you'll say, well, why not? Well, you can find, and we'll find some, uh, some contradictions, and we're going to go through that. Uh, uh, the Essenes believe, for example, in an immortal soul, which we know is not uh, comparable to the rest of the Bible, which doesn't show that. Now, so I'm looking at this, and there's a couple of warning signs. Enoch, in the book, is claimed to be the son of man, born for righteousness, well, that's pretty big stuff right there. Well, what do we mean by this? But what does it tell us? And this is the English Standard Version in Luke uh, uh, 944. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about Jesus Christ in Luke 922. Saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That sound like Enoch? It's a direct description of Jesus Christ. And Luke five or six verse five, uh, and he said to them, "The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." A statement of Christ. So we've got this repetition of the Son of Man, not not Enoch being the Son of Man, but Jesus Christ. So to me, that was a pretty big warning sign. It says, "Wait a minute, that is, just doesn't look right." So, and I've mentioned earlier uh, about the. Uh, uh, about the uh, idea of the immortal soul, and we'll get to that. Another warning sign that stuck out to me was the Book of Enoch introduces the concept of hellfire, which simply did not exist in the older texts of Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, you don't find hellfire, a belief in that. So you find it in the Book of Enoch, and then it was uh, this concept was developed during the Middle Ages uh, as well, with Dante's Inferno and such. Uh, but that's probably one of the reasons it wasn't well accepted uh, by the Jews uh, or, the, uh, uh, or the early Christians. So what I want to do now is with these warning signs, I want to go through 10 uh, reasons that show contradictions or inconsistencies or proof as to why Enoch uh, uh, has a hard time being considered to be scriptural. First of all, the book of Enoch mentions Noah. But Enoch was gone years before Noah was born, uh, about 300 years before Noah showed up on the scene, and yet it talks about his talk, uh, as if Noah, Enoch was relating this first person uh, in Enoch 10, verse 1 through 3. And if we do the math, Enoch was born about the year 622 after the creation of Adam. He was taken away at age 365, and he was no more in the year 987 after the creation of Adam. 
But Noah wasn't born until what? What is that? Not quite 200 years afterwards. A hundred and, uh, what is that, 20, 30, 170 years later, Noah was born. The Bible never states anywhere that Enoch returned to earth after he was taken away and was no more. Or he wouldn't be a was no more person. So now, so we've got the, uh, the uh, we can conclude that Enoch was not a contemporary of Noah. He didn't live at the same time. So it would be really hard uh, then to say that uh, that they uh, they had a discussion or observation of each other. The second uh, point is that in the book of Enoch, the corruption and sin is blamed on the demon Azazel. And the whole, as we look at Enoch 10, uh, uh, verses 8 and 9, and the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, to him ascribe all sin. What's interesting here is that the Bible never names any demon except Satan the devil, the originator of sin. In fact, we take a look at that where he's named, uh, where it points to the one who sins in 1 John 3, 8. Uh, 1 John 1, 3, 8, or 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But other than you stay, have, hear the references to Satan, Lucifer, uh, the devil, the adversary, you don't find references to any of the names of any other demons. So that's inconsistent with the rest uh, of Scripture. The uh, And actually, if you go into the book of Enoch, it names a whole list or a number of other uh, demons as well. Um, Third, the book of Enoch suggests that the demons repented of their sins. Well, this is an interesting uh, thing. I hadn't heard in any other, uh, in any book in the Bible, in Enoch 13, verses 5 through 6. From for from thenceforward they could not speak with him, meaning God, nor lift their eyes to heaven for the same of their sins for which they had been condemned. Then I wrote out their petition and the prayer in regard to their spirits and their deeds individually and in regard to their request that they should have forgiveness and length, meaning long life. So the suggestion there is that, well, the demons were able to uh, repent and be forgiven. So you have this uh, uh, concept that maybe Satan and the demons could be uh, repentant. And so you have this, uh, this, it raises this idea uh, in the book that's not in uh, any part of the Bible. So let's take a look then at uh, a little further exploration here in Matthew 25, verse 41. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says, And this is Christ speaking at the final judgment. He will also speak to those on his left, saying, Get away from me, you who are cursed. Go off into the fire prepared for the adversary and his angels. Doesn't sound like there is repentance of the the Satan and the fallen angels. Because Christ is saying that's where they are to go from one side. uh, And the the ones he's saving uh, to the right, the others to the left. Let's then take a look at, uh, at point four. The book of Enoch states that the demons could no longer speak to God. Well, we already read Enoch uh, 13, 5 through 6, about uh, from thenceforward they could no longer speak with him nor lift their eyes. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? Except that when we read Job, and I put this in the Common English Bible, Job 1, verses 6 through 9, it's an entire discussion between God and Satan. And we have this, uh, where the divine, uh, the divine beings, children of God, came to present themselves before the Lord. And the adversary also came from among it. And then you have the discussion about Job and so forth. So we have this direct contradiction uh, from what the, the book of Enoch says as compared to uh, uh, what the scripture says in Job. The, uh, you can't, because we can't have it both way, both ways. Now we take a look at uh, point five. The book of Enoch describes the new Jerusalem differently than the Bible. Let's take a look first at Enoch 14, verse 12. Its walls, too, as well as pavement, were formed with stones of crystal, and crystal likewise was the ground. So that's described in the book of Enoch. But how does 
uh, how do we read the description in Revelation 21, verse 21 in the New King James? It says, the city's main street was pure gold, as transparent as glass. Not just crystal, it's gold. So we have a discrepancy here, okay, in number five. And there are other contradictions in the Bible. Uh, if you read in this section of in Enoch 14, 9 through 25, you'll find a whole fistful of uh, contradictions similar to this. But I'm not going to list them all today. We, we're trying to keep it under an hour and 15 minutes here. So, um, Then we take a look at point six. The book of Enoch says that angels could not come into the presence of the Lord. Well, we've already read that. None of the angels could enter. On Enoch 14, 21 through 22, none of the angels could enter and could behold his face by reason of the magnificence and glory. Well, that's a pretty bold statement right there that none of the angels could. Yet, this is a direct contradiction to what Jesus Christ himself said to the disciples when he was teaching little children in Matthew 18, verse 10. In Matthew 18, 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Oh, well, once again, we can't have it both ways. Do we going to believe Christ or are we going to believe something that was written 3,000 years after the life of Enoch? The seventh point that I have uh, is the book of Enoch, chapters 10 and 12, say that the angels married women. Now, we mentioned this a little earlier, and the watchers came down to earth and, and married the women and had children, which were giants. And then the world as, as, uh, became corrupted by the evil works and God sent the flood. And of course, we know that angels did not reproduce with, uh, with women. Uh, and I would again direct you to Mr. Sandy's sermonette on March 20th of, of 2021. Um, but there were giants on the earth. So they're playing on that history. But those giants were not the product of angels marrying men. And when you get into it, you'll find that it's really talking about the... Uh, uh, the children from Seth's line marrying children from uh, Cain, uh, Cain's line, which is the which is the speculation as to what why there were why there were giants, um, because we also know that Enoch, that angels didn't come down and marry women because in Matthew twenty two verse thirty, what did Christ say? Pretty good authority. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So he's saying when people are resurrected to enter the kingdom of God, they won't be marrying because they'll be like angels of heaven. They'll be spirit beings at that point which uh, do not marry because as we understand uh, that we are all to be the bride of Christ. There's a relationship that we can't fully understand. Uh, but it will not be uh, as it's stated where some people try to say that angels are marrying uh, humans and then producing giants. Um, <clears throat> then we have <clears throat> point eight. The book of Enoch teaches that angels are bound in a special place in heaven for eternity. <clears throat> and that's an, in Enoch 21 verses 9 through 10. And yet the Bible describes differently that one third of the angels became demons and were cast to earth with Satan. And we read it in Revelation 12 verses 3 and 4, and then in verse 9, that a third of the stars of heaven, meaning uh, a great fiery dragon, and the third of the stars of heaven, his demons, and threw them to the earth. At verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So they are bound in a special place in heaven if they were cast out uh, down to earth. So we have this point eight. Then point nine. <clears throat> oh, beg your pardon. We have more proof on point eight. We also read in Matthew uh, 25 and verse 4 that uh, uh, 41, Matthew 20, correction, uh, Matthew 25, verse 41. He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, how, if you're stuck in heaven, how are you going to be cast into a fire uh, for eternity? And the same thing with Revelation in 20, verses 7 and 8. We read that Satan uh, will be released from prison, so there's a place for him. 
uh, and will go to deceive the nations. So you have this conflict that is unresolved uh, in the book of Enoch. So now let's take a look then at, uh, at point nine. The book of Enoch says that the souls of the dead are reserved in heaven. And this is a brain stretch uh, for me in hollowed out places in rocks. Uh, and you have to read it in context. I pulled out this particular verse in Enoch 22 verses 1 and 2. Then Raphael answered, one of the holy angels was with me. These hollow places which have been created for the very purpose that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein. Yea, all the souls of the children of men should assemble here. Well, my head's about to explode right about here. So let's take a look at uh, a little deeper uh, into this. And the reference is one of the more odd ones, but somehow the spirits are contained in hollow rocks. And it also gives rise to this notion of immortal soul, which is a satanic concept we read about in Genesis 2.17 and uh, compared to Genesis 3.4. And of course, that was uh, God says, you eat this fruit and you'll die. And Satan, what does Satan say? You will not surely die. And yet this is then promoting uh, that people don't really actually die. The spirits are kept in hollow places in rocks in heaven. Um, uh, continuing on, that these souls of the dead reserved in heaven, uh, we can read in Ecclesiastes 9.5. In Ecclesiastes 9, 5, For the living know they will die, but the dead know nothing. We read this frequently during a funeral service. When people are dead, they are asleep, they are at rest, they know nothing. Verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work, device, or knowledge, or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So it's a common destiny for us, and we know that that is, that is asleep awaiting a resurrection. And then that resurrection in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, we read about, and the dead, and what is that in verse 16, and the dead will rise, and Christ will rise first. So they're dead. And now we have this resurrection. We don't have them uh, uh, literally holed up in hollow places in rocks uh, as an immortal uh, being. No need to resurrect because they're already there. And why would they say they're dead if they're already being reserved? It's, a challenge. Now let's take a look at the tenth, uh, uh, the tenth point, um, and that is the Book of Enoch has many scientific and astronomical and meteorological contradictions. In Enoch 33 verses 1 through 4, it talks about counting the stars of heaven. Well, that's interesting. We've got uh, uh, astronomers that are trying to do that all the time, and they can come up with little tiny estimates as to what they think or so. But what does Jeremiah 33, verse 22 say? In Jeremiah 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. A lot of sand in the sea. And I've been to the coastline, and perhaps you have too. Let's just sit down and count them one grain at a time. So I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. In other words, it's an expanding. And if we put other verses of the expansion of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So counting out the stars of heaven is putting a limit here on God. But God says you can't do it. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, let's go on to something else that's uh, counter-biblical. Uh, and this was the brain bender. That uh, wind, hail, snow, clouds, and moons all came out of wooden receptacles or wooden boxes. Uh, in, in Enoch 41, verses 1 through 4. And I'm hard, really hard put to find an explanation for these phenomena. Uh, now, and I'm stretching my brain. I'm thinking, well, where does this come from? And there's this story from Greek mythology uh, that you may be familiar with uh, about Pandora's box. This Pandora is a, is a Greek uh, goddess that was invented by in Greek mythology, modeled after Eve, the wonderful, uh, uh, perfect woman, except that in the Bible, Eve was created to be a helpmeet and to work with man, whereas in the Greek mythology, Pandora was meant was the uh, uh, meant to frustrate man. Uh, sounds like some relationships I know. Uh, but the if you go back to this uh, period of time uh, in Greek mythology, that uh, Pandora was really uh, quite malicious uh, in that sense and not a wonderful companion. But Pandora had a jar, later, later, later called a box, 
that where she kept bad things in. And so we say, oh, no, somebody opened Pandora's box. Oh, bad things are going to come now. In fact, there's a, a drive by uh, every day for nearly a decade uh, to my school, and there's a liquor store called Pandora's Bottle. And I'm going, I can't believe they named a liquor store because uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, anyway, so I'm thinking of other expressions. What bad things can come from containers? And we have the expression, can of worms. Uh, and years ago, I heard one about bowl of spiders. How do you contain those? You know, once things are happening, they're, they're happening. So I cannot imagine that uh, weather uh, coming out of uh, wooden receptacles as uh, simply a, a physical impossibility. I can't even figure out a rhetorical possibility uh, on that one. And the Greek mythology came from about 600 uh, B.C. Oh, we're right there in that intertestamentary period where this was the kind of literature in the Greek world that was being populated. So at the time the Book of Enoch was written, this was part of the culture in the literature for secular literature at that time. So the writers of the Book of Enoch had to or were likely aware of, uh, of uh, the issues relating to Greek mythology and Pandora. Now, if we take a look at the summary of the problems with the book of Enoch, Enoch claimed to be the son of man, to be born for righteousness, and yet we know Jesus Christ was the only one that did that. The book of Enoch introduces the concept of eternal hellfire, which we know is in contradiction to scripture. The book of Enoch mentions Noah when they were not contemporaries, what, 170 years approximately apart uh, uh, and couldn't have known each other. Sin and all corruption and sin is based, based on a demon, Azazel, and yet Satan is the bringer of, of sin into the world, and we're responsible for our own sin. Uh, we're responsible for resisting Satan. Uh, a suggestion that demons repented of their sins, and yet Christ has said that they will be cast with Satan uh, uh, into the pit. States that no, uh, demons could no longer speak to God, and we know that that wasn't true, and we have the evidence of, of uh, Satan speaking to God in the matter of, of uh, uh, Job, and we can go through others about placing Christ on the Temple Mount and other, uh, other uh, explanations in the Bible. We also have description in the book of Enoch about the New Jerusalem, which is different than the Bible. Uh, uh, then we have the, said that angels couldn't come into the presence of God when clearly they can and have and have done. It states that the angels married women, which we know cannot happen, and that angels are bound in a special place in heaven for eternity, which there is no scriptural evidence for that. It says that the souls of the dead are reserved in heaven, in hollowed out places in rocks. And yet the Bible very clearly tells us that the dead uh, are asleep, uh, and are a subject in, uh, to the resurrection. And then it has those scientific uh, contradictions and, and impossibilities that make it very difficult. Now, if you notice, I've just limited this to a dozen here. First, I had a couple warnings. I listed 10. Uh, and so I haven't gone through everything that we could on here. But, but uh, And I'm not suggesting you do because uh, you could run screaming over the cliff with all the stuff that, that you may find. It's interesting, just like I read uh, uh, the authors of Robert Heinlein and Michael Crichton and Edgar Rice Burroughs and other sci-fi writers, which are intriguing, and they satisfied my itching ears, and I want to buy the next book. Um, what did the Apostle Paul warn us about in Titus 1, in verses 10 through 14? The Apostle Paul was aware of these writings, uh, or at least some of them. Remember, there's a compilation of a variety of them. For there, are, in Titus 1, verse 10, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, those who are faithful, those who are working to follow God. But he said, even those, they have what we call idle talkers and deceivers, the itching ears ones. Hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? We jump down to verse 13 and 14. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Where would he get the idea of Jewish fables? Do you see how many pages we looked at in the previous, uh, in the previous PowerPoint, in the previous uh, Bible study about how many writings there were? Now, 
uh, because most of those writings had a name of a famous person or a biblical character or somebody that was widely known at the time. So I want to pull up this meme that I pulled off of, uh, of the internet. I got it. We have to be careful of all false attribution of authorship. And here we read this meme that says, don't believe everything you read on the internet. And it's uh, supposedly said by Abraham Lincoln in 1868. Well, there was no internet in 1868. Lincoln died in 1865. And so this gives us the idea that we should maybe test whatever is placed before us rather than accept it. Now these, what we have as a Bible is still, we are required to test it. Look up to make sure that these things are so. Don't give traction to things that are conflicting in the Bible. And if you see a conflict, be sure to talk to one of the speakers here so they can address those conflicts. See me, uh, you know, uh, talk to the conflicts that you see so that we can look it up and do the research and present those things because that is our responsibility and our obligation is before God is to test the details uh, to build us up in the faith. And remember the whole focus here is to better able to follow the commandments of God that it will have, we will have good results and not the bad results that are listed. We want to do it for the right reason, not just avoid it for the bad reasons. So with that, that's my exploration of the first book of Enoch. And please don't put me through too many more of these, uh, <clears throat> uh, if you would.